warm welcome to everyone who's joined us today in this new format of Virtual Sankalp Global Summit and the second edition of KEF Conclave. COVID-19 has exposed deep fractures in the global fashion and textile industry. While businesses grapple with financial implications, workers, artisans, and other value chain stakeholders also face grim realities of unemployment, inadequate social security, hunger, and disease. Once the dust settles and the industry resets priorities to recover, the need for building inclusive businesses will be fundamental. Businesses can no longer ignore the impact it has on the people that lie at its very core. With around 5 million people involved in the Indian textile industry alone, businesses ranging from social enterprises to large corporate brands need to seriously reflect on their values, operations, and business models to integrate inclusion from within. With this background, we are delighted to present our session on designing for inclusive business models. Bringing together diverse perspectives from industry experts on various models of integrating social inclusion into their businesses. With voices from the captains of the industry to on-ground workers and artisans, we have a stellar lineup for you today. Um, to begin with, um, it gives me immense pleasure uh, to welcome our moderator for today. Um, with more than 25 years of experience of using design to transform businesses, and now using business design and entrepreneurship at the bottom of economic pyramid to transform society, Jacob Matthew currently leads Industry Foundation and is pioneer at shaping the discourse of purpose-driven entrepreneurship. Product designer by training, uh, Jacob co-founded Tesseract Design in 1985, which later became Idiom Design and Consulting and Dovetail Furniture. Companies which have played a key role in the development of organized retail sector in India. Currently, as the CEO of Industry Foundation, he has been instrumental to move thousands of artisan producers from the informal sector to the formal sector organized into producer-owned Cooperatives. Industry Foundation works on participatory processes to create livelihoods for the underserved in creative manufacturing vocations through formal secure work. Thank you, Jacob, for joining us today. And I request you to please switch on your video. Our next speaker today comes with more than 27 years of leadership experience across various global positions in designing, sales, business development, and project management. Currently, as a global business leader at IKEA Social Entrepreneur Initiative, she leads IKEA's pioneering global initiative to partner with social entrepreneurs and social businesses with special focus on inclusion, empowering women, and supporting vulnerable groups to gain economic empowerment through livelihood. Responsible for setting the strategy, developing the business model, securing rollout and partner evaluation, Vaishali Mishra has been instrumental in driving partnerships for IKEA that create ripple effect for communities and society at large. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome her to our panel today. Thank you Vaishali for taking our time to join us from Sweden and I request you to kindly switch on your video. Thank you Trina and Nancy. Um, our next speaker today comes with a unique background, leading the initiative to introduce technology into textile value chain and facilitating better connection between brands and manufacturers. She is the co-founder of Supply Compass. Supply Compass with the mission to make sustainable sourcing easy and cost-effective is a production platform that uses cloud-based technology to enable brands and manufacturers to produce together and better. Flora and her co-founder Gus spent two years living and working in India to build foundations of the company in 2016 and 17. They worked directly with manufacturers and factories in India to ensure a unique grasp of this side of the business uh, before actually launching Supply Compass in 2018. They currently have a very wide network 
in strategically located uh, locations uh, such as Nepal, Portugal, China, and Spain. Flora heads up commercial product and sustainable strategy and hopes supply compass um, can be a catalyst for positive and systemic change in the fashion industry. We're very excited to have Flora joining us today from London. I request Flora to please switch on her video. Our next speaker is truly special and inspiring. Conversations about inclusion remain incomplete without voices from the very people who are at the heart of it. Starting her career as an artisan, Bunkar, she is now a Bunkar Sakhi, a weaver's companion, going beyond the call of duty and inspiring others like her to join the movement of dignified livelihood, financial independence, and empowerment. An accomplished leader transforming the lives of over 100 weavers in the Aspura village in Rajasthan, Prem Devi has been a torchbearer for her community and traveled beyond her village to be recognized in international platforms and winning global laurels. Prem's inspiring leadership and enthusiasm has been also instrumental for Jaipur Rugs' special project, the Manchaha Rugs. Manchaha Rugs are co-designed by weavers and customers to produce one-of-a-kind rugs using industry waste. Each rug is handmade and the story of its creator, emotions, dreams, and personality. Finding inspiration in both the simplicity of their surroundings and the complexities of their mind, the Artisan Originals Collection is sought after by art lovers across the world. I am extremely delighted to have Prem join us today and hear straight from her about her journey. I would also like to welcome Himanshi from Jaipur Rugs for all her support in facilitating this conversation. I request Prem Didi and Himanshi to please switch on their camera. Building inclusive businesses demand an ecosystem approach that enables such development and paves the way forward. Our next speaker represents this very ethos. Ishita Sinha is a program manager at Lourdes Foundation, focusing on the intersection of business and human rights in the fashion industry. Her work at Lourdes aims to shift power and mindsets in the fashion industry towards greater equity, strengthen worker agency, greater transparency, and stronger regulatory environment. Championing equity and inclusion for the most vulnerable stakeholders in the fashion industry is core to her work. Lourdes Foundation is our session partner and is a global advocate for transition towards circularity anchored in social justice and inclusion. We are delighted to welcome Ishita today here with us and I request her to please switch on her video. Thank you. Finally, our last speaker for the session and definitely not the least, representing one of India's largest textile businesses, the Aditya Pirla Fashion and Retail, we have Rashmi Shukla, brand head of Jaipur. Rashmi has managed multiple portfolios within Aditya Birla Fashion and Retail. As the head of Jaipur, she's spearheading the endeavor to bring India's most beautiful artisan fund to the global consumer. A creative thinker with an entrepreneurial mindset, Rashmi believes in keeping the social fabric at the center of every business decision. She has significant expertise in marketing, consumer insights, digital, and e-commerce. We welcome you, Rashmi, to our panel today, and I request you to kindly switch on your camera. With that, I hand it over to Jacob to begin the discussion. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, and I'm really excited to be uh, in this group. Very inspiring for me to be uh, moderating this uh, discussion. So let me jump straight to it. And the format that we will follow is that uh, I will ask uh, some of you questions and then we will go around uh, with questions to uh, each of you. So I want to start with uh, Ipshita um, from Lourdes Foundation. And my question to you is that uh, Lourdes is an ecosystem builder in the circularity space. Uh, you place a lot of emphasis on inclusion. Um, could you share with us about the work that you're doing as a foundation? And how is it going with mainstream businesses and brands? How are they ex um, accepting 
this need to go to a circular uh, to a circular business and what are the challenges and incentives that work for them to adopt this so that's a loaded question for you thanks jacob um i'm going to try and break it down into parts so starting with our initiatives within uh, promoting circular businesses right and more importantly how do you weave in social inclusion within circular business models and how do you try and promote that so the reason we are here is the pioneering work that we are doing with intelicap and caif uh, through the circular plus working group um that's a you know that's an example of how social inclusion can be weaved into circular business models a uh, very early at the design and inception stage itself um that said our other big partner is fashion for good which is a sustainable you know innovation platform accelerator curator and again um in uh, you know in process of every innovation and curation of um, you know design ideas or business model ideas that they're doing they are embedding uh, aspects of social inclusion uh, what is social inclusion i think that needs a little bit of definition so uh, this could include aspects of worker well-being worker uh, you know worker empowerment but also elements of transparency and traceability um, built into these models and that's where sort of moving beyond circular businesses to just larger traditional business models and where we as louder step in in promoting social inclusion what we found is that um, voluntary initiatives don't necessarily make the push for inclusion or um you know make the push for uh, equity in supply chains and therefore we as a foundation are moving towards a more um mandatory um regulatory environment that supports businesses and the ecosystem in promoting um inclusion so examples of this is um supporting within europe the mandatory human rights due diligence norms which um which would then have impact on um sourcing countries such as india and um, you know others in south and southeast asia and ensuring that there is a uh, deep transparency within the supply chain there is acknowledgement of informal workers home based workers in supply chain and that acknowledgement and recognition then leads to fair working conditions and an equitable and inclusive uh, supply chain so that's one big push the at even at the domestic level in india you will see that the indian government has brought out non financial reporting regulations for listed businesses where a lot of big um, you know garment industry fashion industry um, you know uh, organizations would now have to report on elements such as these on um, you know human rights reports on their supply chain on how their supply chains are uh, being transparent and being responsible um, so how can we uh, scale and support these kind of policies and uh, support businesses in achieving uh, these uh, you know in achieving the mandates of these regulations that's an area that we are focusing on um, and just to close another area that we are focusing on in addition to our big thrust on transparency is how do you ensure especially the most vulnerable workers within the supply chain have access to social protections um you know traditional business models we, we you know we do find um, a lot of home based workers a lot of informal workers who are not necessarily recognized in the supply chain and as covid sort of showed to us very prominently that you know when the tough times came they, there really was no fall back support so how do we create those kind of social protection mechanisms that workers can fall back on uh, because that's that's when we'll have the true uh, the true measure of inclusion when everyone has that support system and feels included in the supply chain so that's another area of work that we are going to be increasingly focusing on jacob sorry you're jacob you're on mute thank you uh, sorry uh, i'm going to jump right across to sweden and to uh, vaishali and uh, you know something that ipshita just said that you know just looking at companies adopting uh circular and inclusive business models through voluntary initiatives is not enough and uh, ikea i know has made it part of its core uh, core business and uh, my question to you vaishali is that how does ikea plan to sort of increase its uh, inclusive value chains uh its supply from inclusive value chains um as you go forward 
and what are the large challenges that you face when it when it comes to dealing with these uh, inclusive value chains and I, I know a little bit of it because I'm on the other side and we know what challenges we pose to you from time to time you know when um, but having said that um, I mean if I could just make a small uh, observation here during this period of COVID um, we were working with more than 1100 women and uh, working with a large customer like uh, IKEA really helped us uh, give the benefits of being in an organized value chain to these small individual uh, players that would, uh, as it were, which would have been impossible otherwise. So I'm actually quite fascinated by how IKEA has made it part of its main business, mainstream business. And I would love to know how you're going to scale it in the midst of all the challenges that you've been facing. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, I think it starts with, if I say so for IKEA, it starts with a vision, which is for better everyday life for the many people. I don't know how many of you know that. So everything which we do or, or sort of uh, plan, it's keeping that vision in mind that whether it benefits by and large, the people we are going to work with, people who are going to use it and people who are going to interact with. Uh, with that said, we have sort of set in a, a clear roadmap for us where we say that uh, there are cle clear three directions for each of the businesses to fulfill. That is that the, the product and higher, I mean product, both product as a product and services included because we are a retailer, how that it can has to be affordable to reach many more of the people which we want. It has to be accessible the way they want. And then it has to contribute to people, planet, and society positive. And that is ingrained in the ethos of every aspect of business, every action we take. So with that said, if I uh, just give you a sort of a perspective uh, in terms of the circularity uh, ambition, and you heard of some of our uh, you know, uh, ambitious plan in terms of getting you know, uh, away from recycled plastic, climate positive. These are, as I said, that these are initiative built in to the to delivering to the three sort of clear uh, you know directions given out to each business then coming to the initiative as such which we started some years back uh, with particular focus on 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 the on the industries like you jacob where we are focusing on women in vulnerable communities and marginalized group so it's a global initiative which we had set up a few years back and the learning from the past experience was that unless it is not in the business, that it is not in a uh, sort of part of the business, then it becomes uh, not sustainable. Then uh, also it is not long-term. And then we already have our CSR initiative like IKEA Foundation. So any initiative which we are doing over and above to complement that has to sit into the business because the business is the way you have the biggest footprint, how you can impact. So when we started working with this, this, this was sort of, I would say, the foundation for how we have to sort of build up this business model. And the, and the biggest take was for us was when we started in was that how do we use our, our uh, big machinery and being a production oriented retailer, how do we use the system which we already have in to sort of synergize and to build on? Meaning that the partnerships, what we started with of course, we, we had to sort of partner and anchor with our existing big suppliers so that they focus on the value addition. They don't focus on the whole aspect of the supply chain of, of buying key raw materials or for that matter, getting it approved. Because if you leave that open for the small players to set off to accomplish that, then it is a big humongous task for them to get what we are after, that the product in an IKEA value chain has to be affordable, has to be commercial and has to be sort of, you know, uh, meet the demands from a customer perspective. So that was the learning which we brought in from the earlier projects. And that sort of also gave in mentors to our existing suppliers to sort of, you know, come forward and support these organizations because they brought on to the table into our palette of supply uh, portfolio, which the others didn't have. They brought in the craft part of the value chain the, the, you know, the beautiful, uh, you know, lo local sort of uh, intake on it, which we were lacking in. And also the learning, I would say the designers for us, uh, it was a cross pollination and collaboration because they learn from the artisans when they started interacting in designing it. 
So I would say that that has to be the base, uh, that it was we use the existing uh, system to help us in terms of using a supply chain, using our IT tools to be accessible, including our big negotiation power accessible to these partners. And then of course, on top of that, uh, it what was important for us that it starts with the business needs. That's the reason it was set in the business that what are the business looking at? What kind of you know, functions, products they're looking at? So we design products with our, these partners who are working with inclusive uh, you know, uh, groups over there that build products which are needed actually in the business. So we push products which are needed at the customer end and the businesses are looking forward to. And that is very, I think, so important. Then to your last bit on challenges, I mean, yes, uh, we went through our journey. Uh, it's not easy to find scalable partners. So it requires patience. It requires that uh, you need to be uh, consistent and be aware that the impact takes time to happen. Uh, and then also, I would say that uh, it also challenged us in terms of our sort of uh, uh, looking for global partnership. How do we sort of bring these partnerships and start looking into, you know, regional or, you know, uh, local wise. So we took smaller stores on board and then gradually sort of ramp up to the level that after seven and a half, nearly eight years, like, I mean, partners like you are supplying products uh, to, you know, uh, all stores even. So it has been a journey over time, I would say that. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's to be part of the business to have a sustainable model, which is built on business needs, I would say. I'm going to use this to jump across to uh, Prem Devi. Um, one of the things that uh, Vaishali just mentioned is that there's a lot of cross-learning. There's a lot of cross-learning that designers get from working with artisans. There is a lot of uh, learning that businesses get from learning, uh, that learn how to work with artisans, enriching the way that they do their business. So a question for uh, Prem Devi is, can you tell us a little bit about your journey as an artisan? How did you start? How did you make this transition from being a weaver to being a bunker sati? And today you've become the face of uh, Jaipur rugs. So, and you travel globally. What have, I mean, so Vaishali said that she learns from people like you. What has been the benefit for you from working with uh, no, global bias, especially in this new range that you're doing. I'm afraid that's a mouthful for you to translate, but yeah. No problem. I just translated for her. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. So, Premi, you have seen this thing that we have told you that you have to learn from the artists. It's a very different way of business model. It's a very different way of working with you. It's a very different way of working with you. तो वो ये आपसे समझना चाह रहे कि पहले आपकी जर्नी जयपुर रक्स के साथ कैसी रही और फिर आप 10 साल वीवी कर रहे थे उसके बाद आप एक बुनकर सखी बने हैं और आज आप देश और विदेश घूम रहे हो अपने प्रोडक्ट के लिए है ना तो ये आपसे आपकी जर्नी के बारे में जानना चाहते हैं और ये जानना चाहते हैं कि आपका वो पूरा सफर कैसे रहा जैसे आप मंझा वगैरह लेते हैं तो वो पूरा सफर कैसा रहा ये आपसे वो जानना चाहते हैं सभी को मेरा नमस्ते मेरा मेरा नाम प्रेम देवी है और मैं आसरा गांव से हूँ पिछले दस साल से मैं बुनाई का काम कर रही थी और अभी पांच साल से बुन कर चुकी हूँ तो पहले मेरे पास में मैं बीस रूम के काम हूँ और अभी अठतीस रूम है मतलब पहले से जब बने हैं तो बुनाई का काम दस पांच साल पहले करते थे अब पहले से इतना चेंजिंग हो गया कि गांव के अंदर सभी जैसे मंचार प्रोजेक्ट आया तो सब लोग बोल रहे हैं कि हमें मंचार दे दो मंचार दे दो और हम और भी मिलते हैं हमारे लिए इसको भी हम कोई तो हम गांव देश विदेश मतलब मीटिंग भी होती हैं जैसे मंचार प्रोग्राम होता है हम वहीं पे भी जाना पड़ता है तो पहले से काफी � so I'll just translate for you guys. So uh, basically she's saying that, uh, you know, uh, she's been weaving 10 years before she has become Bunkar Sakhi. And Bunkar Sakhi actually means the weaver's friend. Uh, because Jaipur has worked with a decentralized approach. So we have just one headquarters in Jaipur and uh, working across 600 villages. 
where uh, leaders like Prem Devi is being appointed as a quality supervisor, basically, and they go to each store, uh, each loom, uh, which is being set at Weaver's doorstep. So what she's saying is, um, uh, you know, when um, previously when she started as a Bunker Seki, there was just 20 looms, and now there are almost 38. So she quite uh, sort of doubled the loom in the particular village as well. Uh, the second point is, uh, Aspura is now considered as the most creative village because this project called Manchaha uh, is being introduced in the Aspura, which is one of the biggest challenge for her as a Bunkar Sakhi as we, uh, where, uh, you know, so Manchaha is actually the innovation where they say, uh, the innovation is called Made from Heart, where on each carpet, uh, the weavers are provided with the loom, uh, with the loom and the map. There is no map given in the uh, Manjaha products. So basically we call it artisan's original. So uh, she had to walk to every doorstep to convince people to work on it. But she's saying what makes her happy is now people are traveling across the globe. She herself is being traveled across the globe for the work that they are doing. And this is what is a differentiating factor where they have the team meetups, where they have the community meetups. They meet and exchange the thoughts and the confidence that she gained as a Bunkar Saki throughout these years is sort of tremendous because she, uh, like as a personality, she never thought uh, that you know she'd be able to, let's say, walk onto the doorstep of each person and convince them to do something which they are not ready to do. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go across to Flora now in UK. Uh, Flora, you are in a sense, um, um, plugging the gap between both uh, vendors from the value chain and buyers in the value chain. And you sort of hold everybody's feet to the fire, um, in a sense, you know, to make sure that there is, I mean, uh, what, what is claimed is what is actually being done. Right? Um, and for you, your key principle is to keep people first and separate, I would say, um, you know, there's a lot of, let's say, greenwashing or you know, whitewashing, which is uh, popular in the industry. And as Supply Compass, you actually um, make sure that that is not the case, I mean, that you are trusted and it's a people first model that you're doing. So can you tell us a little bit about how you do this and how sort of enforce this yeah um great question so i think i mean for for, for us even though we call ourselves a technology business it it has been about people from day one the foundation of our company was really built when me and my business partner moved to india lived in mumbai and spent basically two years traveling around visiting factory after tannery, after mill, we've visited organic cotton farms. And really we came with a kind of blank slate just to listen, learn and build relationships. You cannot build uh, a software that sitting in your office in London when ultimately your users of your, of your software and your partnerships are out there um, in, in the field. So from the beginning, it was about people. And ultimately that is where I derive most joy from the business. That is where our team enjoy being is inside, inside factories. So I think that for us, we have a role to kind of, our kind of mission and our vision is really to empower brands and manufacturers to produce better together. And so really we've got a, a kind of, we've got to empower brands to want to do that. Um, the, the one is there from the manufacturing side. Um, and, and really um, when we talk about better, we talk about better products, we talk about better relationships, we talk about better buying practices. And it's a tough job sometimes being in the middle because from a commercial standpoint, we we're looking for new business to bring our manufacturers. But ultimately there's also this point where you go, no, that, that is, an accept, that is not acceptable behavior. And you know, brands can get away with behaving how they want, behaving one way and then it doesn't work for them. So they move on to the next and no one's holding them accountable. And so really for us, we see the role of technology there in the future being you know, encouraging better behavior on both sides, but more from, um, from the kind of buying practices side. So there's that part of, of it. And I think for us, um, 
spending time inside factories and understanding the role technology can play as an enabler, not something that gets in the way, something that actually can make our manufacturing teams, our merchandisers on the factory floor, QA inspectors, what actually will make their lives easier. We don't want to bring and build a technology that is hard to use, that doesn't actually understand the behaviours of people in each country. My background was in market research, so I used to fly around the world and observe people in their natural um, habitat essentially and understand how businesses could build around like real behaviors and understand culture as well around that because what may work for one of our manufacturers in Portugal may not work for one of our manufacturers in Tirupur and so for us it was learning you know that it needs to be a mobile first business in India particularly if it's on a desktop it, what our merchandisers are on the factory floor most of the time they're not going to be walking around holding a desktop it needs to be in their pocket it. they're using whatsapp that's how they're managing their quality assurance on the factory floor so it needs to be easy and built around so really everything we do is built is is listening and learning from humans from, from people right thank you um for rashmi um you are representing a large uh, uh, conglomerate business uh, in india um and with varied interest in retail. And now that you've taken, uh, I mean, with Jaipur, you've moved into a very different sector from what um, you know, the Tabula Group was doing uh, previously. So you see, I mean, I mean there are two, two levels of mainstreaming that I see Jaipur having done. One is bringing the artisanal traditions into the mainstream. And the other is to bring in social inclusion. I know Jaipur is one of the websites that have been keeping uh, artisanal products as part of the COVID um, uh, rehabilitation program that one of the uh, entities that uh, we've been doing together, Creative Dignity, uh, has been, and that you've sort of jumped in uh, to help in there. Could you tell us about you know, this tension about working in a large company with varied interest and yet handling a business which is you know, very focused on quality, handcrafted, inclusive uh, output? Uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, absolutely. I think it's, uh, I'm at a very interesting place uh, representing ABFRL, which like you said, is a large conglomerate and is the leaders in the country in um, uh, in the apparel sector. Uh, we recently acquired Jaipur and are very proud of what we, uh, what, you know, what we got with that, the skill set, the artisan and the inclusivity that we wish to build as we go along. Um, at the helm of the business, which I handle, it is now important for me to unpack and unlearn uh, and start the inclusivity at the base which Jaipur brings to the business. Uh, so for example, uh, when you say, um, uh, like, like for example, the Artisan Direct program, uh, at the start of COVID, none of us had the playbook rule book uh, as to how to start the, the, the month one it was a little bit in fear and denial, but uh, Jaipur at the center of it is committed to the cause of artisan and it is not for uh, always a for-profit cause. Uh, so when when we got an opportunity to help uh, the artisan base, which probably was sitting with surplus stock and nowhere to go, uh, we were uh, more than happy. And th this is what happens that at a larger network, you get the platform to be able to back your intent with action. So we uh, we did not even blink before thinking that we are, we are happy to let go of our margins because right now, in this global pandemic, the, the need of the hour was to stand with the artisan, uh, ensure that we guide them, we train them, we help them to reach out, uh, reach out the consumer. And we also wanted to ensure, you know, we, I think we are all in, in this, all of us together, to ensure uh, that we create a balance between pre people, profit, industry, and nature. Uh, uh, which something, you know, I am uh, in some conversation before at Lords and somewhere, you know, at, at the whole building up nature, we've learned that the balance is what is the important part. So Jaipur does that at the center of it. CSR is not an activity for us. The business is based around uh, keeping the interest of artisan. And that's where we look at uh, building the journey forward. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I see here two businesses uh, that are represented by not CSR or 
you know, foundation level activities, but mainstream uh, business level activities. So one of the questions um, that I have is, um, again, for, I, I would start with Flora. Flora, in, in many cases, you know, uh, visibility and transparency, traceability is available when you're dealing with tier one and tier two suppliers. Very often that traceability sort of, um, you know, evaporates because it's so difficult um, because of the number of sub suppliers and so on uh, involved. So, you know, as, as inclusivity and traceability and transparency becomes more mainstream, what are the challenges and what are the measures that can be taken to actually take traceability right down the value chain? Great question. Again, I think, I mean, you've hit it, you've hit the nail on the head. It's complicated. And, you know, it's food supply chains can sometimes be kind of more linear and, and you know, see like every time you place a reorder, it's the same supply chain. What makes fashion supply chains in particular complicated is that every season, every product in your, in that collection you're producing with a factory may have a new a whole new supply chain altogether beyond that tier one. Uh, you know, new, new material supply chain, new raw, something may have happened to that organic cotton supply chain that you previously used last sketch, you may need to use a new one. You have so um, many different trims and components feeding in. It's really complicated. And I think that the challenges that lie, I mean, ultimately our goal is to build that traceability right back to the raw material. But we're doing, we realize very early on that it would only be accessible, cost-effective and easy if there, if there is a digital ecosystem at the heart. Otherwise, it's always going to be retrospectively um, traced or it's too much time in the kind of front part for getting that, to get that tr uh, traceability that, you know, ultimately people need to bring product to market pretty, pretty fast. It's also incredibly time consuming. So if it's not digital, it's going to be very manual analog process and it's going to take, it's going to cost in time and, and also in money. So really there's that part of it, but also that you need to get every single individual in that value chain understanding the value of traceability it makes sense you know the end the end brand or retailer um, and maybe the tier one partner understands you know they they need it they, they need to show it to either their end customer but ultimately why why does everyone further why should everyone further up that value chain put in that effort it's, it's a lot more effort to do if there's no what's the what's the value for them so it's um really it's it's got to be baked into a process. Um, and that's really what, you know, we're trying to build with our digital ecosystem is that by default, you know, by the very nature of designing and producing products through our software, that comes as standard. But that is a journey. We, we're, we're not there. We're not able to get there overnight. It's going to take years and it's going to take understanding how those individuals way further up the um, raw material supply chain, if you're working with hemp, for example, or with our direct with our organic cotton farmers, how do we make it easy for them? Right. Um, so technology is going to play a major part here. And uh, Vaishali, one of the things that you mentioned is that whatever you do, I mean, one of the challenges or one of the methods that you used to bring in inclusivity into your uh, value chains was to use the existing processes and systems that you had already built out at a large scale. So one of the questions I have is that you've got You've got um, massive ambition. I mean, like um, uh, I was fortunate to be at uh, Democratic Design Days in IKEA, and the announcements that were made during that Democratic Design Days was actually quite staggering, staggering, and made to a large audience. So my question is, how are you doing this now, and what would you need from people like Flora? What would you need from people like um, you know? Uh, uh, let's say industry, I mean, where I come from, which is a supplier. And uh, the last part of the question is, uh, you've been huge evangelists as well. And from personal experience, we were introduced to H&M Home by IKEA. I'm saying like, what? Uh, why would you do that? So the question is, how would you work with uh, somebody like uh, Jaipur, for example, and you know, exchange uh, uh, best learnings in this journey? I would say that, I mean, it's uh, building on to what just Flora said. I think it starts with the, you know, the vision 
and it's also starts with looking into you know a tougher demand so yes i mean uh, we have a very comprehensive in terms of uh, uh, the both in terms of our demands, in terms of uh, creating inclusive supply chain, both from socio economic and environmental perspective, we have set, set in also high ambitions. But all this, I mean, uh, be it even where we are today, for that matter, like I mean, uh, the the my, I mean the the biggest part of it is our still our furniture. We couldn't have moved it with without the without the collaboration approach with WWF and the likes. So I would say one of the important pillars in terms of where we are today is also because uh, that one needs to collaborate. If you have to move on this agenda, which is so huge, you can't do it by yourself. And IKEA, yes, we did so because. Uh, in the start where we have big volumes, we have big reach in terms of our stores and online. That of course makes us, uh, you know, with that volume, we are able to sort of, you know, uh, uh, have a business case which sort of makes it possible with big suppliers to reach out. But it can only take you to a certain distance. You, it can't, you can't go it a mile if you do plan to do it all by yourself. So we had to join forces together right from the very beginning, be part of Better Cotton Initiative, be part of WWF, join forces together with, uh, you know, uh, Work Surf League for looking into the plastic waste. So I would say that that's very important. And then coming to the point in terms of in the space I work with, with inclusive suppliers like you also, uh, one of our aim also is in, in the initiative is what we measure ourselves internally is, is that uh, how independent the partner is becoming, how, how we are making them employable. And that's one of the steps, yes, you mentioned, we introduced you to uh, H&M Home, because that is one of the, uh, you know, the, the indicators for us internally is that it should not be totally dependent on IKEA. Because if you have said that, then you have not created a sustainable business. You need to work in a network. You need to reach out. And that makes us, I think, uh, more open to, uh, to our model, which, is, which we introduced some years back in OpenX, that it is not possible. We had a, for years, we had another model. Now we had an OpenX model, which says you need to collaborate and you need to cross-pollinate and learn. And that goes also what we do it with the initiative. Like we make it a point because each partner is different. We make it a point that they sort of become a network and mentors to one another from a good practices. And that is very important to inculcate uh, a behavior in terms of how we see uh, learning and how we see total approach on circularity and sustainability. And that has helped us a lot, I would say that in our business. And that's a methodology we use both internally. I mean, we measure internally ourselves, each of our product, how it has sort of, uh, you know, meet the circular principles. Uh, and that is part of the way of working. So I, it has been, uh, sustainability has been in the core and not on the side. And that has helped us to make it move. And that has put also a, a, a pressure on us to collaborate more. So I would say collaboration is the key uh, going forward also especially now, I mean, where the, we are in the situation uh, and there, if you have to really move mountains out with the challenges coming forward, uh, more so is needed. Thank you. I mean, I think it's so refreshing to hear um, this thing about collaboration, about having um, people talk to each other and come to come with, uh, my experience with many brands has been that they don't like their vendors talking to each other ever. You know, they like to keep them separate. But I mean, this is really uh, refreshing to hear. I have a question for uh, uh, Prem Devi. And that is that, uh, you know, you were talking about the Manchaha Innovation Lab. And when you started work there, you got rid of the graphs. You know, the, 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 the designer gives a graph and then the weaver follows that. And uh, I, I just wanted to know from Prem Devi that when that restriction of the graph was removed, what was her feeling? She did say that other viewers found it difficult, but what was her, her own feeling when she had the full freedom, the full creative freedom, as it were? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jacob, for the question. So, uh, Didi, you asked me that we told you that we had a lot of difficulty and the rest of the viewers had a difficulty. 
बट जब वो आपके पास आया तो आपको क्या लगा जब पहली बार मंचा ऑर्डर आशपुरा में आया तो आपको कैसा लगा कि बिना नक्शे पे काट के काट लिया उस बारे में बताइए मतलब शुरू में जब मंचा ऑर्डर आए थे तो मेरे को मतलब सुन के डर दे के एक बार से कि मैं भी नक्शा कैसे चलेगा फिर भी मेरे से बात भी की तो वो लोग भी मना कर दिए थे 15 15 दिन तक पढ़ा रहे तो बोले कि भाई साहब ये तो नहीं बनेगा तो बोले कैसे भी बनवा दो फिर बाद में बोले कि कुछ भी बना दो लेकिन सर गलती हो जाएगी कि हो जाने दो गलती हो जाने फिर कैसे भी करके बोले क्या बनाएं मैं बोली मैं कुछ भी बना दो साड़ी में से डिजाइन देख लो दुपट्टा में से देख लो कुछ भी बना दो लेकिन बनाना है तो बोले खराब हो जाएगा खराब हो जाएगी तो लाएंगे फिर किसी के पास मोबाइल लेके फोटो खींच के डाल दी फिर भी धीरे-धीरे करके आगे डाल दी कि मैम के पास मैम ने बोला कि कैसे मतलब ऐसे बहुत अच्छा बन रहा है थोड़ा सा बस थोड़ा सा बारीक हो गया है ऐसे कर कर के इतनी ही लगन हो गई कि अब सब बारीक डिजाइन बन रहा है और सब मन चाह और मन से एक दो नक्शे वाला रस तो बोलते हैं कि मैं खुद ले जाऊं मैं तो हजार रुपए कम ले लूं लेकिन मन चाह दे ओके सो शी इज सेइंग दैट हर फीलिंग व्हेन व्हेन मंजा के फर्स्ट टाइम टू आसपुरा शी गॉट स्केयर एंड शी टोल्ड हर ब्रांच मैनेजर्स एंड अदर क्वालिटी सुपरवाइजर्स दैट प्लीज टेक दिस ऑर्डर बैक बिकॉज़ वी कांट मेक इट एंड दैट वाज द फीलिंग व्हेन द मंजा फर्स्ट केम टू हर एंड शी नीड्स टू टेक केयर ऑफ द अदर लूम्स एज़ वेल बिकॉज़ शी इज समबडी हु नीड्स टू स्टार्ट दिस पर्टिकुलर प्रोजेक्ट इन आसपुरा so but she got scared with that particular thing and the other viewers they did not open up the sack for good 15 days is what she is saying and she used to go to every doorstep to tell them that you know any which way we have to start and start with anything like whatever you are thinking even the design patterns you see in a saree start making that over the rug but we have to start anyhow uh, but in the second phase she also uh, she is also saying that um, now is the situation in aspura that every artisan says that please take back the map order and give us 1000 rupees less but give us manjaha to make uh, because now everybody is uh, you know go on uh, like this is being recognized so much and being loved by the people so much uh, that you know she said that now everybody loves making their own rugs they do not do not want to make the designer product anymore So yeah, this is uh, this is the, what she has to say about Manja for coming to us, Pura. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, um, uh, very often as a designer, um, the most terrifying thing to get is an open-ended brief. You know, a completely open-ended brief that can be really terrifying. And we actually follow pretty much what uh, Prem Devi said: just get started, and everything <laughs> else will follow. right thank you so much for that insight now um when it comes to working with artisans like prem devi and doing collaborative work so it's not just inclusion in terms of uh, livelihoods and money or earning money um my question to rashmi is in jaipur how do you create these collaborations these creative collaborations between your designers and the artisans and perhaps the end user is there some kind of um, process that you follow or you know something that makes this thing happen so jacob uh, uh, this works at two levels uh, and as a designer i think you will also understand and appreciate at one level in the parallel universe of fast fashion uh, businesses are creating 12 cycles a season and let's get to the consumer faster but at jaipur we are trying to counter it by saying uh let's not create new for the sake of new because that's when you are creating artificial obsolescence in the system and that is what generates wasteful uh, you know uh, wasteful in everything in, in activity in the time of the designer in the time of the artisan uh, so while uh, we champion innovation but we are not wanting to create new for the sake of new which is creating the 12 season cycle a calendar and making the consumer feel under the pressure that they are always supposed to be catching up with the latest trend or latest fad uh, at the other level with the artisan we first focus on the strength of the artisan uh, so depending on the clusters that we are working with so if, there, if there's a cluster where we are working where the artisans are adaptable in full patti category 
uh, we take their strength and the motto at jaipur that we follow is uh, good craft meets good design uh, and we don't need to elaborate as to how much heritage and craft and unique design that that's available in india but um, for us like uh, like a lot of other friends here to be a part of business and you need to create demand for that it has to be baked into business so we take the strength of the artisan because that's where they do best and our designers help uh, them to make the designs a little more uh, relevant and functional for today's use uh, and that's how we we collaborate and what is required is patience capital so in, you know in a in a different sector of the industrialized mass manufacturing you're working with a different set of people but when you're working with the artisan the biggest thing that is required at the designers end is the patience capital and once you have that the collaboration eventually results into some really unique differentiated and beautiful creations and um, which is what and, and what to uh, in in a good sense with the pandemic which uh, you know has put in so many challenges across the world but what is has also pushed all of us has uh you know to think through even more deeply as to the kind of choices we are making as consumers so now it completes the circle between the designer the supplier and even the consumer who is looking at you know uh, the designs and the products that they are buying more thoughtfully and now this, this is uh, this is what makes the collaboration even more stronger thank you and um you know when you talk about the consumer the um uh, the producer and the retailer you know where does the buck stop in a sense and here is a question from juliet and uh, ipshita i would like you to first um, have a go at this juliet's question is that you know while flora uh, has said that you no know, traceability is very important um whose responsibility is it and who provides the resources for actually having this kind of end to end traceability so one is the consumer does the consumer have to what is the role that the consumer has to play in demanding um will traceability be provided only when the consumer demands it question 1 uh question 2 will a retailer support a manufacturer in um assessing and supporting the resources that are needed for this deep traceability and third is it the manufacturer's responsibility to provide this so i mean we have three players and where do their responsibilities start and where do their resources start and end so i would uh, ask you first ipshita and then pass it on to flora and vaishali for their remarks okay so i'm going to give the foundation's perspective um nothing is as powerful as the consumers demand we have the two brands who are sitting here and i'm sure you know they're going to voice this nothing is as powerful as the consumers demand yet as a foundation uh, given the limited resources that we had uh, we have chosen not to go down the path of um, consumer education as part of our initiatives because we felt a that a that should be brand led we believe that our support can be more catalytic if we are working more within the supply chain and within uh, the ecosystem with you know with other civil society organizations and other innovators within the supply chain so while completely endorsing that consumers um you know consumers will sort of um you know demand for, for changes in business models or traceability or demand accountability at the foundation level we've chosen not to go down that path but focus within the supply chain now your second question in terms of you know who bears the burden of um, you know traceability comes at a cost transparency comes at a cost and who bears the burden for it should it be the manufacturer should it be the retailer um and this is where um you know our again our focus on that if this is sort of left to be negotiated between different parties there is a skew of power dynamic right i mean flora did touch upon uh, purchasing practices and how they are you know they are skewed in a certain direction because you know that's how the industry functions and there is uh, you know there's the retailer who typically would tend to have uh, you know a, high, a slightly higher bargaining power if not more than slight in other cases and therefore um you know again our take is that um how do you sort of redress that power balance it 
you know, it could be directly at the worker level by strengthening worker agency. So I can give a very tangible example of how we're doing this in the state of Tamil Nadu, which is so, you know, so very relevant for India's textile, um, you know, uh, export industry as well as domestic industry. We are now uh, supporting uh, an alliance of 100 civil society organizations who are working with communities and workers there. And they have come together to demand for tier two transparency, tier three transparency, that is, uh, you know, transparency at the spinning mill levels, because right now, you know, transparency in the supply chain typically goes down to the first and second tier. Why are they demanding this? Because once there is acceptance of, you know, of the supply chain going down to the level that it does, then, the, you know, these can be priced into those purchasing decisions and those conversations can can be started. It can be reflected in terms of, uh, you know, um, in terms of wages that are being defined at the tier three level, or it could be in other working conditions, conversations at, at those levels. But the point being that, um, you know, it, it, the responsibility cannot be held at one particular end. There has to be a balance of power in the supply chain. And that's what we're looking to redress that how do we sort of try and address the balance of power through bringing information out into the public public domain and through supporting the more vulnerable in the supply chain. So I hope I've been able to answer the components of your question. Thank you. So um, over to Flora and then to Vaishali. I, think, I mean, I'm probably not going to say anything so new in what I'm going to say, but I think Ultimately, consumers are powerful in terms of their influence, and that is who brands and retailers really care about. And if they push, then they will listen. So I think consumers keep keep kind of fighting their fight, but I think ultimately it's got to be brand-led initially, but I think the responsibility has to kind of be spread across. And I think you need someone to drive. And I think ultimately brands do need to be, um, it, it needs to be a kind of requirement for them. But I think what's really important is that it's not just another demand that brands place on their manufacturers and suppliers. This is now a new requirement and we will not be paying for it. It's got to be, as we've been speaking about today, the kind of collaborative approach, working together, um, and, and really it just needs to be worked on over time. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. And this is goes back to this thing of, you know, building long-term collaborative supplier and manufacturer partnerships. Um, but I also think that you can't expect every brand or re retailer to have these expertise in-house. So I think it really falls on investment in this space to invest in more organizations and systems that can support across and can support brands, retailers, and manufacturers and suppliers to achieve this in a cost-effective way. Um, so I think really, I think there's a big question mark around investment in this space. Thank you. Vaishali, from a brand's perspective. Um... I think uh, already someone said that, I think it was uh, Ipshita, that uh, if there is a demand, I think that will always push in uh, downstream. So I think the demand from customer will play a vital role. However, I would say if I look at our uh, IKEA perspective, we decided that then you can, as a brand, you can decide you want to be a follower or you want to lead it. And, and then we decided to lead certain aspects of it uh, because it was important for us that, and how do we do that? I mean, we, we did that with inviting others, those who were interested in to join forces together. And that was we being one of the uh, initial, uh, uh, you know, part of the founding of the Better Cotton. If I say so, we did so also when it was uh, with WWF, with the, with the wood part of it, with FSC. Uh, because we put that puts a demand downstream in the supply chain to sort of get the act together. Then, of course, you need as a big brand, you have a bigger say in terms of joining forces with local and regional institutions, with governments to on the legal aspects of it, on demanding, because a lot of the demands which we sitting as a European brand are from a product perspective or so is very, you know, in a European Union per se, for that matter, if I say. Uh, it's a stricter demand. But we can't operate our operations based on the demand in one region. 
we had to set it all because the products when manufactured in in the in the in the space which we require we can't have multiple demands in terms of traceability that we steer it that this product goes to only to european union and this goes to north america and this only stays in asia that doesn't work in supply chain meaning that we have a bigger say as a big brands to sort of lead it and then it is a conscious decision of the brand that they want to lead it or they want to wait for others to follow so it's very important i would say brand will play a important role also as a big brand how i see it both in educating the customers so as a role as a as a per se if i say if we are not educating and creating awareness through our products how then it is you know sustainable how it is circular and through that how as a customer you are contributing downstream i think that dialogue needs to open, happen and that has to be sort of i would say that not waiting for the people are getting educated with the digital space they are getting they are knowing more about what's going around but big brands will play an important role uh, putting us in the in the forefront of how do we lead it because it will create a demand downstream meaning you need to join forces together with with our suppliers downstream to sort of you know equip them empower them uh, and then go in hand in hand in terms of going further to the three or four tiers Uh, for example i say also like with the new one with the with the plastic initiative we had to join forces with world sub week because you can't do it alone when you're going into the plastic waste stream in into the into the commodity aspect even so i mean there again the collaboration will play an important role resources it, it's resource intensive and we decided way back when we introduced our iwe compliance not 20 years back a little bit over 20 years yes uh, that it is an investment and we decided to do that because that was we that was an investment for a long term and we see that in in now after 20 years because things which we sort of set in we set in as non negotiable and that put in that took us a while that took us big suppliers to accept it some fall out in on the way but that was a conscious decision taken by us that this this part of it especially where we are focusing on uh we will go cool hand in hand and then those who are not interested will of course will be fell out of it but uh, those who are really interested in joining forces together go down uh, they are and we have partnership over long period of time because they decided uh, uh, and for us also it takes time to be an ik supplier for the very fact that we are looking into uh, into strategic partnership where there is an alignment of the values which we are after and of course that means of course you are not policing you are empowering the suppliers in terms of making them equipped with resources with infrastructure that helps them in facilitating it because then it is then it is a development and you have to see it as a development way of going downstream uh, and that's what we decided and it took us 20 years so it was uh, and and up and up so it's we are still not fully there there are things which needs to be sort of further do uh, done and we are finding that in some of the materials but it is a long we knew it then that it's a long haul it is an investment but you have to do it uh, because then i mean if you do it then i the like minded also join forces together and then it creates a demand so that i say i i would conclude by that demands will uh, from the retailers big retailers it will play an important role in this vaishali this is absolutely fascinating and you know in my head when i try and wrap my head around what you've just said um many of the things that you have taken uh, a lead in instead of being a follower um would be what industry normally considers as an externality you know not my problem it's just the cost of doing business the government should do something about it or you know environment wwf should do something about it or we consider these as external externalities even the use of plastic for example um what i hear you saying is that you are taking these so called externalities and you're recruiting a bunch of external partners to actually sort of work together with you but also at one level hold your feet to the fire so in a sense you're making yourself vulnerable there actually to a lot of inquiry when you take the leadership role and then through this process of collaboration you're making an internal you're making it internal and an integral part of your business i find this absolutely fascinating and i'm and, and i'm also quite um um uh, interested i mean not interested i'm also quite um, taken up that this requires you to be vulnerable at one level you know it's not 
that you can do this from a position of strength and be the sort of 800 pound gorilla in the room. So this is really fascinating. And I think it is uh, you know, superb for the rest of us in this group uh, to learn from. We got the flag also, and sometimes in the past we got the flag also. So it's that, it's also you you have to be, and if you're not, then you will not be able to move the agenda. And we know that, and we know that. And that's the reason you need to collaborate downstream with industry experts who are there and uh, both equipped internally. So I'm in uh, Jacob, I don't know how much you know, but uh, in the operation aspect, we, we have compliance developers and auditors. So developers are the ones who are working with development with the partners along with their teams and the auditors and third party auditors are totally out of it because that puts us in a check in terms of also what's working and what's not working. So, uh, and that is required. I mean, to manage this uh, in a, such a huge organization with big partners, you need to have that collaborative and development approach. Now, I have a question for uh, Rashmi and for uh, Prem Devi, which is really about, you know, um, when you look at artisanship and these um, um, sort of creative manufacturing uh, industries like. Uh, what Jaipur Rugs is doing and what Jaipur is uh, promoting um, is what happens to these crafts? What happens to the next generation? What is it that you're doing? And my question to Prem Dev is really about what would she like her children to do? Would she like them to be engineers, doctors, or would she like them to be weavers? Does she see a future in this? And, uh, um, and, and to Jaipur, my question would be, what are you doing based on what... <laughs> Uh, Prem Devi's answer is, right? So I want you to react to what Prem Devi has to say. Yeah, over to you, Manchi. Sure. Um, uh, so you have to say that when a a अगर आपकी बात करें तो आपके बच्चे आगे आप क्या करना चाहोगे उनको डॉक्टर इंजीनियर क्या बनाना चाहोगे या वो भी इस जो कला है उसके अंदर कुछ वैल्यू देखते हैं मतलब कि जो हमारे आसपास में है ना रॉयल राजस्थान फाउंडेशन वो चल रहा है तो उसी में हमारा नाम है 25 लोगों का तो हम अच्छे उसमें जो बाहर से विदेश से डिजाइन आते हैं सिखाते हैं हमको डिजाइन बनाना और हमारी ट्रेनिंग भी होती है वहां पे तो बच्चे भी देख के खुश होते हैं जैसे हमारा एक व्यूअर्स का एक तो बेटा था तो उसके इंटरव्यू हुई थी तो उनके बच्चे बोल रहे थे कि हम इतने पूरे पढ़े लिखे हैं हम हम तो फिर कभी गांव से बाहर तो थे ही नहीं और आप तो कि मतलब आप अनपढ़ हो के भी इतना नाम रोशन कर रहे हो तो मतलब बच्चे तो लगा ही रहे हैं कारपेट बनाने में तो और आप अपने बच्चों को आगे क्या बनाना चाहते हो या वो क्या कैसे देखते हो अपने बच्चे मतलब अभी तो छोटे हैं पढ़ रहे हैं तो अभी तक तो उनको पढ़ाई नहीं बड़े होंगे तब तक तो फिर बाद अगर कोई लग जाएंगे जो तो सही है नहीं फिर ये ये तो करवाएंगे फिर इनका काम तो और या फिर कुछ प्राइवेट कंपनी में भी जॉब कर सकते हैं किसी डिजाइन को लेके छोटी बेटी हूँ तो अभी तरह तरह का फूल डिजाइन बनाती हूँ मेरी सो जेकब शीज लाइक टू ऑल ऑफ यू शीज सेइंग दैट यू नो वी हैव अ डिजाइन लैब इन आसपुरा थ्रू दिस थ्रू आर कोलैबोरेशन विद डॉय ब्राइडसन फाउंडेशन सो दे गेट लॉट ऑफ एक्सटर्नल डिजाइनर्स लाइक लॉट ऑफ इंटरनेशनल डिजाइनर्स इं and that's when she says that you know a lot of kids get interested in these things and you know where they see that a, these like their mothers are taking the quotes from a lot of designers and now what they are making in their car is something very different that's how they start taking started taking the interest the second she also uh, you know narrates the instance about one of the weaver's son uh, she was actually uh, she actually went to this rajasthan patrika you know, uh, office to give the interview. So he uh, said that, you know, you are traveling and giving the interviews, being an illiterate, and you know, like I'm studying so much and I'm not able to do any of such things. Uh, regarding your question that, you know, what uh, what uh, uh, Prem Devi want, want her kids to do. So she said, uh, right now they are very small, so they are studying and, uh, you know, they 
they will uh, she wants to uh, she wants them to study and her younger uh, and her younger daughter she is very interested in making the designs so she keep on drawing these uh, flowers and leaves and additional things and she said that you know as and when the interest flows uh, uh, like she's not decided yet or she can also go and do the private job wherein she can become a designer and do the designing on the screen is what she is uh, she have to say so basically you know the pride that these guys are uh, getting in seeing their mothers for their achieving with the craft they are like very slightly started taking interest in you know what additional things they are thank you so much and it's interesting now yeah so um um i think i can tell uh, prem devi just before i got onto the session i was doing a class with my students from design school and i hope that maybe one day her daughter will be at our design school um but having said that um you know this is this is really um i mean this is really insightful because i think artisans and crafts people are creative designers at heart and as they get more and more involved in the design process um you know the stickiness factor goes up especially if there's a living to be made of made of it but what's really important is what is their creative contribution and how is it being uh, recognized so you know for uh, jaipur the brand um while the creative contribution comes from the artisans what is jaipur doing in terms of building up business skills for these artisans right so uh, that's a question that i have for you uh so taking from where prem didi said uh, uh, you know jacob uh, the next generation will always be attracted to whatever is more desirable and i think as industry seniors and leaders it's important for us to make uh, the artisanal life more desirable and build more pride in it uh, so as a part of what we do at jaipur and thanks to technology the world is becoming far more flatter uh, there was earlier a divide between the grassroots and the urban commercial matrix uh, but thanks to technology uh, we are all connected um, as a part of artisan direct for example um, jaipur groomed and coached all the artisan as to how to shoot we were not able to provide them our studio at delhi because nobody could travel and they couldn't send the goods to us but uh, technology allows us to teach them coach them how to do photography how to do costings how to build up logistics um, and even then building up pride in their own work so we provide um, at our website and at our platform uh, not just their product and like you said their designing but a brand building to these artisans and that's what happens to the next generation that when they are seeing their parents that they are becoming uh, stars in their own manner Uh, where where their skills where their art is being celebrated it kind of inspires the next generation saying my world is all my you know is recognized my work is recognized um what uh, the skew in favor of the if i may loosely call the urban glitz uh, it kind of starts waning away because then you start seeing the world as a, as a slightly more equal so i think as industry leaders and brands our job is to not just build products for commercial purposes but also to handhold all the artisans and help them build structure their life around this which is how the next generation will continue to get keep getting inspired this is this is the part of the work that we do with clusters uh, where actually with about seven clusters at the last count we increased our work from about uh, 36 or Seven thousand people, and that involved an entire village. And when when there is enough demand for entire village to do work, then everybody gets involved, including the next generation. So it is important that we, like we, like we are saying, bake it in the business and make it attractive and desirable for them, and meaningful. What I'm hearing is, if brands create demand and bake inclusion into their business, then there is. um yeah there is hope for the next generation to stay uh, involved in these businesses um one of the big problems i mean like covid is on everybody's mind and has actually in a sense disturbed uh, things all around uh, maybe having even taken inclusion a few some say 
15 years back, some say five years back, some say 10 years back. But um, inclusion has got a little bit of a, a push back during, during COVID uh, because of the lack of preparedness. I mean, the suddenness, the, the entire global uh, thing happening all at the same time everywhere, throwing supply chains out of gear and so on. And a lot of people tell us that uh, this is just the beginning and that we can expect more and more such uh, events. So my question to brands, to people like Flora who support brands and you know, uh, look at how inclusion can come back on the front foot as it were. Um, what are the measures that you're taking? What are the challenges that you're facing in a COVID-like situation and you know, going forward into more of these sort of extreme situations that we may face? So I, is that for me? Yeah. yeah. You could start and then I I'll start. Yeah. Rashali and Rashmi. I think, I mean, it's been an incredibly tough year for everyone um, across the supply chain and for brands. Um, no one has been hit harder than those further up the value chain. But I think what's interesting is this period is re you really see businesses for their true colors and whether they are good in their core. How do people react when things really fall apart um, do they protect themselves only or do they reach out to all of their partners and work together and explain situations and I think really what I'm seeing is the businesses who have revealed perhaps what they're really like underneath are not necessarily flourishing in these times um, and I think that those, you know, when, when factories reopen back up again, those brands who were decent to their factories and who worked with them, they were prioritized on the production line because they saw what they were like in that time. And I think that even though we've gone back five, 10, 15 years, I think that what it does do is it makes, um, it really forces that, <laughs> It, it makes you really have to think about what kind of business that you want to be and whether actually you can afford to not be a good business anymore. I think from our side, um, it's challenging. You know, ultimately brands are having 90% of their orders canceled from wholesalers. Um, so they actually can't sell that product, but at the same time, if they're committing to something and they're contractually obliged to order, order a fabric, then they can't get out of that and they've got to find other ways. So I think it's, it, is, it is really challenging, but I think that um, keeping that focus on strong relationships and thinking long-term and not just jumping ship um, and sticking. I think what so many brands forgot to do or people forgot to do was that in that time, having conversations, just talking through what they were going through with their manufacturers or suppliers and say, these are the challenges we're facing. I understand these are the challenges you're facing and having that open conversation and kind of finding a middle ground rather than just being really blanket saying, I need to save myself here. Um, so I, I don't have a straight answer because I think we're still in the middle of it. Um, and it's, and it's, 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 it's difficult. Thank you. Uh, Vaishali, what, 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 how does IKEA handle something like this whole disruption? And you know, where sometimes your manufacturers also start taking shortcuts because of the you know, um, issues that they have faced. I mean, uh, so we haven't been sort of, you know, untouched by what's going around. I mean, with uh, store closures and till yesterday, it was, I think, now 59 of our, uh, you know, markets uh, at the stores are hit again in the second wave. Uh, of the stores, especially now Europe, which is uh, strongly hit by the second wave and the maximum number of stores we have it over here uh, and then in US. So uh, uh, we are definitely in the middle of it. What has of course come off in, uh, in this is also, uh, for especially if I look at uh, us because we work with varied materials across supply chains and bigger ones. In fact, in the very beginning, uh, I think in early spring itself, we set up our, uh, you know, uh, CMT teams, which was looking into how to work. Their, their whole assignment was to work together with partners to see in this, if there are no orders, how we can diversify. We diversify, we were talking together in terms of uh, local needs and diversifying into something which they had not done. And what we saw that the partners were more than willing to come forward 
to make you know uh, uh, PPP, PPE tools, I mean uh, uh, overalls, masks, uh, bed sheets, uh, because we had home furnishing uh, for hospitals, and also we quickly sort of put in put in place uh, you know a team which uh, look into the needs and steered the production towards that because the stores were closed anyway. But we were we were looking at there was a huge demand in other sectors of uh, of uh, industry and that is i think that's made us most of us working for our company more proud because this was uh, the moment which i mean uh, it was uh, you know uh, a crisis situation where there were not enough sort of ppe tools and suppliers i can tell you all across in india and all across the globe were diversifying right from who were making totally different comfort invested in to make you know ppe or or the other tools gloves uh, shields so we went into looking into how we can engage them in terms of looking into what was the need coming out and most of it was on the on very close collaboration with the governments or or uh, you know uh, uh, you know institutions and even ngos uh, who were sort of leading that and we still do continue doing that after even the ramp up happened, especially for the partnerships like what we have in social inclusion, what we ensured that we don't deduct the orders and, and then change the model. In fact, we had center based for most of you, including you. We quickly adapted how it can be home based. And what do you need for in terms of home based, in terms of the tools, in terms of time? And we sort of did that, uh, you know, uh, as fast we could, depending on how ready the partner is. That's the second step we did. If I come uh, zooming in into the partner, the inclusive, uh, the partnerships which are like social businesses, uh, we ensured that we were in regular touch with them in terms of uh, looking into not only the well-being in terms of any support required, because our other part of the organization started in looking into emergency relief fund, how that relief fund could be utilized for either equipped them with the necessities along with already what the government was giving in but also in terms of looking into what kind of trainings do they need now is it their infrastructure sort of you know need now so we sort of had a close dialogue the other aspect we quickly adapted was in looking into now with digital how do we use digital tools to continue because they were sitting with at maybe middle of the design how do we sort of have that interaction over digital the other aspects on a more at a corporate level, then of course it means it means that we would require and needed leveraging support in collaboration with all the stakeholders, getting act together. So we we sort of joined forces together with the with the with the with the Schwab's together, where a good number of uh, big brands came in together to have a collective approach. That was another that not not necessarily mean reaching out internally into IKEA and its ecosystem what is needed elsewhere even. So we did that uh, also. Government support, you need to talk and leverage along and talk to them about how they want to utilize these capacities effectively and how we can sort of, you know, join forces. And PP is one part of it, but from the home furnishing, there was a whole lot of hospitals coming up temporarily, how we can sort of join forces together. So I mean, collaboration again in the ecosystem was played a very important role and we continue doing that because uh, that we see as a need of the hour, which will be for some time soon, both in terms of uh, in the markets where the stores are, but where we are also sort of buying. So that in that level of both at a, at a partner level, supplier level, we are in constant dialogue with both our big suppliers and small suppliers. And that's the, that's, I would say the beauty when we saw that how the, now the stores are closing or the others, the, the, the learning from the first phase one we sort of adapted, we are sort of carrying forward quickly into the second now when we are now sitting, especially us here and sitting now in the second day. So, I mean, and we will continue doing that. I mean, and that is part of our values, I would say that. So it's for us, it came in and made us more proud that, uh, you know, we, we looked into the fact how we can sort of, uh, you know, I remember early morning meetings where because we were all across the globe sitting and I was only part of it looking from it. But the other ones, I mean, enthusiastic co uh, colleagues of mine sitting in Asia and all over who were first hit 
and then here uh, to collaborate and steer, talk to governments, talk to army, how to steer the capacity. So I mean, uh, looking back, I felt that, you know, uh, when you put your act together and use your resources effectively, I mean, so you uh, have, yeah. that's you'd needed. Have your, you'd have got your early warning from China and then yeah. moving across the world. Now, and um, most, yes, exactly. What, what is really fascinating is perhaps we are still in the middle of it, as you say, you know, and there's a second lockdowns that are happening uh, across Europe now. But I mean, maybe it's too early to talk about this, but what I see is that there is a huge amount of learning that has happened over the last six months. And what gives me hope and encouragement, um, you know, when we talk about inclusivity, circular value chains, is that there's been a tremendous amount of learning over the last six months. There has been a tremendous level of collaboration. There's a tremendous level of um, you know, sharing of resources that has happened. And uh, that is really what we require. I have a last question for Ipshita, and you have only one minute to answer it. I'm afraid we are uh, al almost out of time, which is that you know, when we talk about circularity, when we talk about sustainability, sometimes there are uh, unforeseen circumstances. Like for example, recycled clothing landing up in East Africa, completely devastating the local industry. Great intention, terrible consequence. Um, what do you think we have to watch out for as we take this movement forward, uh, Ichita? So I'll be really brief and link back to something that I said right at my opening, which is social protection systems in place that cover all workers. Currently, our social protection systems are only designed to cover formal sector workers. COVID, you know, I mean, Vaishali was speaking to it, but COVID sort of reflected that how uh, the workers were not part of the formal supply chain. They really did not have a fallback option. This will increasingly uh, become more of a factor as, you know, what you mentioned, circular bottles may have unintended consequences or just as vulnerabilities in the supply chain increase due to longer term impacts of COVID, therefore social protection systems. How these are designed, whether the you know, whether the responsibility lies solely with the government or are these contributory systems where the supply chain pitches in with government systems, these need to be designed and seen and co-developed. But we firmly believe and strategically we at the foundation are going to be focusing on strengthening social social prote social protection systems for garment workers. So uh, thank you very much, all of you. And a special thank you to Nancy and Trina for helping put this thing together and you know getting all of us uh, together. I think it's been a tremendous conversation, a uh, lot of work to be done and some really inspiring uh, insights from uh, Prem Devi, from Ikea, from Jaipur, um, Flora, you've got a You've got your hands full, I, I would say, uh, keeping all of us on track. And thank you very much for your uh, time and patience.